So I know everyone is hungry and hypoglycemic now, and there's been an overload, knowledge burst, and it's it's difficult at times to you know to absorb so much of knowledge. So I promise I'll keep it very short and sweet, and we'll keep it as interactive as possible, and uh, we can have the presentation. Yeah. So I'm talking about inhaler devices, and this is just going to be a general talk, and. Uh, I think this is extremely important because this is something as physicians, pulmonologists, you know, we deal with patients who have obstructive airways diseases all the time. And a lot of these patients, you know, uh, the therapy is all inhaler devices. Unfortunately, we don't talk about it to our patients and we don't do a good job of it. And that is why this is very important. So, you know, it's, it's a big problem. Patients don't understand inhalation therapy. The biggest problem is patients don't like inhalation therapy. There is so much of stigma attached with inhalation therapy that once you, you know, where I come from, uh, Delhi NCR, Faridabad, which is, you know, in Haryana. So if you start an inhaler device to a patient, 90% of the times you have lost that patient. It's something like, you know, when diabetologists, they start insulin for a patient, the patient doesn't like that diabetologist. So it's the same that, you know, this physician, this pulmonologist has started out on an inhaler. It is a habit forming thing. And, you know, you've started an inhaler for my young daughter. How will she get married? So you are labeled as a bad doctor and you've lost that patient forever. Unfortunately, we as physicians don't understand this therapy ourselves. So because we don't understand the benefits of this therapy, we don't pass it on to our patients. And we don't explain our patients why this therapy is necessary and how to take this inhalation device properly. So this is few of my practical cases, 16 year old female who was referred to me from Ranchi. I had gone to Ranchi to take a lecture on omalizumab. Those days omalizumab was the hot thing, 2015 I think and uh, we had gone to you know take a lecture on uh, omalizumab in Ranchi and you know this, this patient was actually referred to me from Ranchi for starting her on omalizumab because shortness of breath, wheeze, all year long, symptoms getting worse during the winters, pyrometry had an obstructive ventilatory defect, she was diagnosed as bronchial asthma. The diagnosis was absolutely correct. She was started on a DPI which contained an ICS and a LABA. The symptoms kept on worsening. Nighttime symptoms were increased. She was added on Monteluca as Derifilin. The Derifilin was stopped due to palpitations. And she was referred to us. She was admitted multiple times in Ranchi with an acute worsening. She was diagnosed as brittle bronchial asthma. This is something that was to be, this was a term during our days, you know, when the brittle bronchial asthma, it's no longer used or difficult to treat asthma. Very poor disease control, daily nighttime awakenings. She was referred to us for starting off a malizumab. So she came to our center and this is what she was doing. She was, she was given a DPI device, a rotahaler kind of a device. So she thought this was VIX Action 500 and she would put it up her nose and she would start inhaling it. We laugh at this now, but this is how bad, you know, the reality of situation is that the patient is taking a DPI device through their nose, trying to inhale it. Poor thing has been admitted so many times to the hospital since till even then, none of the physicians told us how to take this device and they were happy referring her for omalizumab. 64 year old male, smoked BD all his life, gradually progressive dyspnea, started on derifilin, still breathless, a very typical COPD history. This is a patient from our Savdajang days. He was referred to Delhi. He was diagnosed as severe COPD. He was started on triple therapy, Laba Lama, ICS. Those days, tiotropium used to be available without a spacer device. The patient presented to the eye emergency the same evening with severe eye pain and blurring of vision. Can any of the PGs tell me what is happening here? What has happened? Why has this patient come to the ophthal emergency in the night where we've started him on tiotropium in the morning? Any, any guesses? So tiotropium can precipitate angle closure glaucoma if it is not taken properly. So you have written he did not take the device without, he took it without a spacer. So the inhaled medicine can actually enter the eye and if you are genetically predisposed, even with a single shot of tiotropium, you can get angle closure glaucoma. So this was angle closure glaucoma which got precipitated because we did not tell our patient how to take the device properly. 10 year old boy bronchial asthma started on a trans cap or a rota cap. Prescription says transcap formoflow once daily. No improvement after starting the transcap. Five days down the line, the patient is admitted to the emergency with dehydration, vomiting, and the boy has been eating the rota caps. So these are all examples that we see in our practice every day, day in and day out. We need to understand that treating airways diseases is not rocket science. It is something which is very easy. However, we need to know about the inhaler devices. No device is the best device. 
you need to match the device with the need of the patient. You need to take time to explain it to the patient. Inform about the paraphernalia, all the, you know, the, the upkeep of the device. Talk about it to the patient. And only then the patient would be able to use it properly. So every time that I start the patient on an inhaler, the first look that I get from a patient is not something that I like. It is a look of disdain, of distrust. So you have to tell them that you need an inhaler because you need to treat the disease topically. If you have an eye disease, you put eye drops. If you have a skin disease, you use an ointment. So if you have a lung disease, it makes sense that you use a drug which goes directly to the lungs because if you use it orally, it is going to be given to you in grams. If you use it this way, you are only going to take it in micrograms. The second question that you will be asked is whether this is habit forming. So you need to tell them then and there that this is a need. If I wear spectacles, my spectacles are not a habit, they are my need. So you need to understand, you need to tell them every time the difference between the habit and the need and only then they would start using it. Always tell them that inhalers are very good for you because you'll use it at lower doses, this is going to decrease the systemic absorption, this is going to actually decrease the side effects and every time, every time, every time they come to you, please try to break the stigma. Tell them that this is not habit forming and you're not going to probably use it for the rest of your life. Now, there are too many inhaler devices available and too many cooks spoil the broth. Every company is going to come and tell you that their inhaler device is the best and you know this is going to have the maximum drug delivery. There are around 75 inhaled, uh, you know, devices, inhaler devices which are available globally for around 25 drugs that we have. And there are so many more in the pipeline and I think so many drugs and so many inhaler devices kind of tend to confuse us. So this is a quiz question for the PGs, which is the best device? I want to have a show of hands. How many of you think a nebulizer is the best device? No one uses nebulizers here? No one is fond of nebulizers? Are you sure you're all Indians? <laughs> I, okay, maybe I'm talking to an American audience today, very happy. Nebulizer is good, all right. Meter dose inhaler, all right. The question is, which is the best inhalation device? I'm not saying good, very good. Three, dry powder inhaler, like a rota cap or a trans cap. And question four, the answer for option four, none of the above. So, there is no single best inhaler device. A single inhaler device should be inexpensive, should be easy for the patients to use. It should be something that the patients like. So a cigarette is the best inhalation device. So what you need to understand is that there is no best inhalation device. The best inhalation device would depend what the patient has, you know, and you need to taper it accordingly. Whether your patient has an asthma, COPD, asthma, COPD overlap syndrome, what device is easiest for the patient to teach, for the patient to use, what is the age of the patient, what is the severity of the disease, how, you know, how, what is the cognition, what is the dexterity of your disease, what is the IQ of your patient, what is the cost of the device, and at the end of it, it is the patient's decision. And every time I'm trying to give a device to a patient, it is not my option. I have to sit down in my OPD with 10 different devices, and I have to tell them that these are the devices that are available. Talk to them, tell them how you to use it. If you don't have the time to do it, use one of your coordinators. All the pharma companies who sell the respiratory device would be very, very happy to you know, give these kind of coordinators to you. So the crux of the matter is keep talking to your patients about why it is important. So if you classify the respiratory inhalatory device, the first are the meter dose inhalers. Meter dose inhalers can be breath actuated and non-breath actuated. Then you have the dry powder inhalers and then you have the nebulizers. So three kind of devices are available for whatever drugs you use. So first we'll talk about the MDI device. MDI is a meter dose inhaler. There's a meter in it. So with every puff that you press, a single amount of drug every time is going to come to you. So multiple therapies are available in MDI format, Saba, Laba, ICS, Lama, everything is available. Very, very handy despite proper usage, even if you tell to your patients to use it in the best possible manner, 80% of the drug is going to get deposited locally. So it is very important that whenever you are using any kind of a device, whether MDI, DPI or a nebulizer, please tell them to rinse their mouth very, very thoroughly after they've used the device. In fact, in my practice, I tell them to use it the first thing in the morning. Why use it first thing in the morning? Because your asthma COPD symptoms are worse as soon as the patient gets up early morning. 
and if they take the inhaler early morning post that they are going to brush their teeth have tea so it is going to probably wash out the inhalation device so how does mdi technology work when you pump when you push in a pump this pump this plume of aerosol which comes out it is going to have multiple particle sizes in it the very small particles less than 1 microns are going to be expelled out bit more than you know uh, 5 microns are going to get deposited in your upper airway between 1 to 5 micron size particle is going to go down to the airways of the lung and this is the particle size this is actually going to be effective and in a single plume of an mdi only around 10 to 20% of the particle size is actually going to be the 1 to 5 microns so imagine around 80 to 90% of the drug is going to get wasted even if the patient is using it to the best of their effort the problem is pmdis generate the aerosol much faster than the patient can inhale so the coordination between the actuation of the device and the patient's inhalation is a big problem so the patients get confused you know when to press it and when they press it they get confused they get you know this is this kind of thing as soon as you press it the patient is not able to start inhalation at that time because the speed of the plume or the pump the aerosol that is generated is much higher than what the patient can start initiation and this is a big problem especially in the children and in the elderly who are not able to understand and not able to coordinate when to press and when to start the inhalation so spacers have been designed to take care of this spacers take care of the actuation inhalation problem they ensure good drug delivery because they act as a reservoir so the fast speed of the inhaler gets curtailed down the drug gets you know kind of a reservoir it gets slowed down in the reservoir it is easy to use however the problem is it is bulky there is a lot of stigma attached with it patients hate me even more when i give it you have already given me one inhaler and now you are giving me another big tube to use with it so you this patient is definitely not coming back so there are going to be upkeep maintenance issues you know every time indian patients you need to tell them that you need to keep it clean the same spacer device would be used by family neighbors 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 so there are a lot of you know problems when it comes to the use of these devices so although in the western settings it is something which is very very good your educated patients well to do patients may be able to use it but then there are a lot of issues with the use of spacers if you use pmdi in children especially with a spacer it is said that it is as good as a nebulizer and in fact if a patient is using an mdi with a spacer it is in an acute emergency in the er if a patient comes with an acute exacerbation of asthma or copd you can actually use an mdi device with a spacer it is said to be as effective as a nebulizer but i don't think it makes any practical sense because you're not going to give spacers you know you're not going to have packets of spacers ready in your emergencies so there is for especially for children there is something known as a kid mask or a huff and puff kit which is available so in children who would not be able to even use a spacer this is for children usually less than 4 years of age there is a mask which is attached to the end of the spacer and again you know the you can the the kids usage of the spacer becomes easier and especially in children uh i i practically find it very cumbersome to use these kind of devices and of course even in children there is a lot of stigma attached no matter what kind of a severe exacerbation the patients or the you know the parents bring the child to you in for one week 10 days they will definitely use it after 10 days some neighbor some auntie would come and tell them that this is habit forming and that is the end of the inhalation therapy for most of these patients this is something which is very very important earlier days there used to be no dose counters so patients would not know when the inhaler has ended and it is an indian tendency you know the toothpaste bottle has to end completely before we throw it so the patients even though the inhaler would have ended a month back but there would still be the carrier molecule left inside the patient would be using the same inhaler for past one year but now thankfully this has ended so all inhalers come with an mdi with a dose counter so when you are sending your patients home please tell them that there is a dose counter show it to them and that when it turns to the red you need to change your inhaler then there is something known as a breath actuated inhaler the beauty of an inhaler was that it deposits the drugs very very nicely as good as a nebulizer but the problem was actuation and to take care of the actuation discoordination problem you use a spacer device but i have told you spacers have their own set of problems bulky expensive patients don't like them so there is something known as a breath actuated inhaler which is available in the synchro breathe format in india now and uh, this is the this is kind of a marriage between a dpi and an mdi device the beauty of a breath actuated inhaler is 
that there is no pump here. There is no button here which the patient needs to push and start inhaling. So the patient just needs to, you know, put the inhaler in their mouth and start inhaling. The flow rates that are required for the actuation of the synchrobreathe device or a breath actuated device are very, very low. So even a patient who is in an acute emergency or someone who has a very poor lung function would be able to use a breath actuated device. So the synchro breathe device can be used in patients where the peak inspiratory flow rates are even less than 30. These patients can use it. So synchro breathe device is now available in our country. It is a marriage between an MDI and a DPI device and a lot of our patients do like to use this device. What is a DPI device? A DPI device is a dry powder inhaler device. There are multiple type of dry powder inhaler devices available in the country. There is something known as a unit dose DPI. In a unit dose DPI, you put in a, take a single capsule. In this capsule, the carrier molecule is lactose. The drug is piggybacked onto the lactose. You put it in a unit dose DPI device, which can be rota inhaler, revolizer, loopy inhaler, mac inhaler, whatever, depending on the company. And every time the patient needs to either break the capsule, puncture the capsule and start inhaling. The important thing that you need to understand with the DPI device is that the DPI device, the drug deposition is dependent on the patient's flow rate. So you cannot use a rota inhaler or a DPI device in an acute exacerbation setting or if the lung function of the patient is too bad. Because here the patient is going to start the inhalation, the drug is going to get released from the DPI device, there is a mesh there which is known as a de-aggregator. The lactose molecule and the drug are going to get separated and the drug is going to get deposited. If your flow rates are not good, the patient would not be able to suck in the DPI device properly. So that is why DPI devices should only be used if the patient is clinically stable. This is a very good device for younger patients who have stable disease, someone who has good flow rates. So you can have unit dose DPIs and then you have multi-dose DPIs. Multi-dose DPIs are something like, you know, the serotide or the SIP inhaler, wherein multiple doses of the DPI are wound on a tube and the patient, you know, did not put in a capsule every time. Then you have the reservoir type DPI, which is the Symbicot turbo inhaler. So multiple type of DPI devices are available in the market. Everyone is going to tell you that their DPI device is the best. That is not true. The device that the patient can use the best is the best device for that patient. So I've told you how this works is there has to be an inspiratory flow rate. Due to the inspiratory flow rate, the drug is going to come to the de-aggregator. The lactose and the drug is going to get separated and the drug is going to get deposited inside the lungs. Which DPI device is the best? Each DPI device is as good as the other device provided the patient is able to use it well. So what is the difference between an MDI and a DPI device? In an MDI device or a pump, hand, mouth, breath coordination is required. A lot of our patients are not able to use that. In a DPI device, no such coordination is required. Break the capsule, put it in your mouth, start inhaling. An MDI with a spacer can be used in an acute setting. A DPI cannot be used in an acute setting for a sick patient. MDI with spacer, bulky, stigma attached to it, uh, DPIs are discreet and happy. A lot of our Indian patients are happy taking the DPI device but not taking the MDI device because at least in North India there is this myth that DPIs are not habit forming but MDIs are habit forming. So, but any patient who requires a high dose inhaled steroid, any patient who requires longer acting muscarinic agents ideally should be given an MDI because in a DPI device, the pharyngeal deposition of the drug is much higher than a MDI device. So if you are giving a patient a high dose steroid with a DPI device, there can be chances of oropharyngeal thrush. So thrush is lesser with an MDI device because the oropharyngeal deposition is lesser with an MDI device. Efficacy is nearly the same. All of them are equally good. As I've said again and again, every time talk to the patient and think which is the best device for the patient. Last but not the least, nebulizers been available in the market for long. We are all very, very fond of using them. The advantages of a nebulizer are it, it, you know, it breaks the drug into multiple small particles. It is very, very good for sick patients, no coordination, actuation, no jing bang required. Just put in the mask, ask the patient to start breathing. That's about it. There are newer ultrasonic nebulizers which are available. So you can actually attach them to your ventilator and use them. So they're very, very good. Even antibiotics, 
you know, uh, other drugs rather, other than uh, the nebulized drugs for obstructive airways diseases can be given with these ultrasonic nebulizers. So the repertoire of the nebulizers is actually increasing a lot. Disadvantages, there is a lot of drug wastage. The nebulizer doesn't know whether the patient is inhaling or exhaling. The nebulizer is going to give out the drug and a lot of these nebulized drugs are exceedingly expensive. Oxygen toxicity, very, very common. Nebulizer mask not available in the emergency, machine not available. Sister will start nebulizing the patient with oxygen. Patients with COPD, if they are nebulized with oxygen, are going to retain carbon dioxide. So don't do this. Nosocomial infection, same nebulizer for the whole ward. For everyone in the hospital, going from one ward to the other can actually spread nosocomial infections. So we need to be very careful. There's a lot of domestic abuse, overuse potential of nebulizers. Patients do feel very well after using a nebulizer, so they'll get hooked on to it and keep using it at home and they won't come back to you. And there's a lot of pharyngeal drug deposition. So very commonly, patients who are started on nebulization and not advised to wash their mouth, rinse their mouth, are going to come back with a lot of oropharyngeal thrush. There are three kinds of nebulizers. The, the most common one is the jet nebulizer or the pneumatic nebulizer, wherein the air is used to generate the flow, you plug it on, the air which is generated from the electric motor is going to break down the drug and deposit it. There is something known as the ultrasonic nebulizer where piezoelectricity will break down the drug and there is something known as the mesh nebulizer which is the new kid on the block. So the jet nebulizer is, is shown here, we've all been using it all our lives. This is something which is known as a mesh nebulizer, it was launched in the Indian market with a bang around 5-6 years back. And they thought they're going to replace all the nebulizers in the market, handheld, battery operated, very sleek, can fit into your pocket. If you look at it, it generates a beautiful plume. What they did not tell us was, you know, there are two kinds of nebulizer solutions. One is a solution, one is a suspension. So if you're using a drug like, say, salbutamol or levosalbutamol, it is a single agent. There are, it is a solution. There are no two molecules in it. So a solution can be used with a mesh nebulizer. On the other hand, if you have a suspension wherein there are two drugs, say a combination of formatrol with budesonide, and if it is a patient who is on triple therapy with nebulized glycopyronium, if you use that kind of a solution, suspension in a mesh nebulizer, it is going to block the mesh of the nebulizer. So it is a very, very delicate nebulizer. It is expensive, definitely. And the problem is that you need to actually take out the mesh, wash it every time you're using, which is not a very good idea for a lot of Indian patients who are not going to use it. So if you have an educated patient who's well-to-do, someone who's on a single kind of an SOS nebulization and doesn't want to buy the really big machine, then yes, mesh nebulizer is, a, is an option, but for all practical purposes, it is a failure in the Indian market. There's something which is known as home nebulization. This is coming up in a big way. So a lot of our patients with advanced COPD, advanced disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, 80-year-old, 70-year-old, no domestic help at home. You know, you can send these patients home on the concept of home nebulization. These patients cannot use MDI or a DPI. Patients with a lot of arthropathy, neuropathy, and comorbidities can use home nebulization. Patients who are very frail and elderly, children who are very, very young and have frequent exacerbations of asthma, or patients who have subnormal intelligence can be sent home on a home nebulization. But anyone who is going on a home nebulizer, please ask them to take care of the nebulizer. Please ask them to wash their mouth frequently after the nebulization. And every three months, you are supposed to call back the patient and see whether they can be weaned off the nebulizer or not. So nebulization versus MDI, GINA guidelines say PMDI with spacer is as good as a nebulizer and should actually be preferred over a nebulizer device, but I, I don't think this is practical, especially in India. So just to sum it up, uh, how do you choose? If I have a child who is less than five years of age, the first choice that I would have would be a PMDI with a spacer, obviously with a spacer in a child, never without a spacer in a child, depending on the intelligence of the child, plus minus a baby mask. The second choice would be a nebulizer. A child who is less than five years of age should not be given a DPI device. Older children, adults, a DPI device or a MDI with a spacer or a synchro breathe device, which is a breath actuated device can be given. In an acute setting, you can either use, if you are in UK or US, a PMDI with a spacer. It sounds very, very fancy. I don't know how they do it. In India, it's always a nebulizer. DPI devices, rotacaps, loop inhalers, MAC inhalers should not be used in the emergency setting. Any patient who requires a high dose of steroid, inhaled steroid, should be given an MDI with a spacer. 
and when it comes to the ease of use of devices, our patients are very, very fond of DPI devices. MDI devices are very good, but somehow people don't like them. So to summarize, choose the appropriate drug and device for each patient. Spend a few minutes training, observe and correct them. Retrain them at every visit and ask them to check the technique. You know, every time, you know, in, in my clinic, we did this very small study of around 100 patients. Every time that we would start a patient on an inhaler therapy, I would teach them an inhaler therapy. There's a breathe-free coordinator who's outside the clinic, would teach them the steps again. So every patient who goes out would be taught the device twice. We did this consecutive for consecutive 100 patients. We called them after five days. And then we saw how many errors were they making in their usage of the DPI or the MDI device. Any guesses out of 100? who were taught twice, once by me, once by my Breathe Free Act coordinator? 30, 40%? Any other guesses? 100%. So there was a checklist. You need to, you know, whether step one, step two, step three. So this was actually very, you know, it was not like they were making everything wrong, but there was a checklist. Whether they have done these five steps correct or not, 100% failure rate. So every time the patient comes back to you, they need to come back with the device. Every time. This is... This is not negotiable, at least in our practice, every time, you know, it's, it's, we've actually got this printed on our OPD prescription pads now that every time you need to come back, you need to come back with your DPI or MDI devices because the most expensive inhaler is the one which is not used properly and this is something which is very, very important. So thank you very much.